Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Mitchell Ringos. For our first story, we head to the township of Conme as a monument was unveiled on Saturday afternoon that pays tribute to Canadian soldiers and police officers in northwestern Ontario. Jessica Clement reports. It was a day of remembrance and mourning for the township of Conme and those who came out for the unveiling of the memorial pillar, which is located right outside of the northwestern Ontario Military and Police Museum. One side of the monument commemorates the conflicts in which Canada participated from the War of 1812 to the war in Afghanistan, while the other side honors the police officers of northwestern Ontario who were killed in the line of duty. Bob Manns, owner of the museum, says it's important for people in Canada to remember the sacrifices that were made for freedom. It's also important to, to realize uh, what and to remember what police officers go through on a daily basis. Uh, I don't think the general public really has been able to grasp the idea that wives or husbands of, of, of those that serve as police officers, for instance, uh, they may be going to work, but they may not be coming back. There's always that chance that that happens. A second smaller monument was also erected to honor Bill Majbaroda, a World War II veteran whose dream was to start a military museum at the Royal Canadian Legion in Kekebeka Falls. He was totally dedicated to it. Unfortunately, he passed away before he was able to finish it. So upon his passing, his wife wanted to know if this museum would like to take his stuff, so we did, and it's on display in there. And it's in his memory for all of, for all of what he's done. In attendance of the unveiling was Chief of Thunder Bay Police Service Dan Taddeo, who says that the amount of work that Mans and his wife have put into honoring military veterans and police officers from the Northwest is very special. One thing about Northwestern Ontario is... Um, there's not an abundance of a population, so we uh, heavily rely on partnerships. Um, Thunder Bay Police Service and the OPP, along with uh, Anishinaabe Aski Police Service and uh, Anishinaabek Police Service, where the, um, we have to rely on each other for a lot of uh, resources and partnerships. We recognize the sacrifices that each of us make, um, but not so much as the sacrifices of those who've, who've uh, paid with their lives. Scott Halati, superintendent of the Ontario Provincial Police for the Northwest Region, was also in attendance for the unveiling and he says it was an honor to be there. It's an absolutely beautiful monument. Um, there are many monuments throughout Canada, uh, but having one in northwestern Ontario that we can come and honour our veterans and our fallen police officers uh, means a lot to us. For anyone who would like to pay their respects at the monument, it's located at the Northwestern Ontario Military and Police Museum at 7 Hume Road West. Jessa Clement, TBT News. The local Alston railcar plan hopes to more than double its workforce between now and next spring, according to the union representing plant workers. This comes after more than half the plant's 400 workers were laid off in February. The union expects to be back up to that number by spring of 2023. Unifor Local 1075 President Dominic Pascalino says they had hoped the company would be calling workers back sooner. With COVID and all the other delays, there are product shortages. So some of the people, I feel, won't be called back as rapidly as what we originally planned. However, we are working to a schedule and we're doing the very best we can at this point. But it'll probably be about the spring, March or so, where we get to be the 400 that we would like to have in the plant. Pascalino calls the current number of workers at the plant at less than 200, a historic low. He is pinning his hopes on a TTC project that has yet to be put to tender, saying if a big contract doesn't come through, he doesn't know how the plant will retain skilled workers. While well, community consultation is underway in the region for the province's planned streamlining of employment-related services under the Employment Ontario umbrella, the Northwest, along with the GTA, are the last catchment areas where the plan is being implemented. The North Superior Workforce Planning Board hosted a regional conference in Thunder Bay this week with agencies and service providers coming together to share their concerns. The provincial government is gradually phasing in a plan to bring together a variety of social and employment services under a single services system manager, a position that is already up and running in other parts of the province. Gary Christian, executive director of the planning board, says the biggest concern he's heard so far is with the number of unknowns, with organizations unsure on how they will be affected or even whether they will still exist after the transition. Basically, it's uh, transitioning services that are currently provided by all different groups under one group 
and that would be the service systems manager. And they'll do with the agreements, approve the agreements, do the evaluations. To a certain extent, there's other things that are involved with that. And they'll, they'll basically help fund organizations that support Employment Ontario. And, and there's always, there's all different windows with that too. So again, it's really complicated. So again, it's difficult to say what it is at this point because we're really not sure where it's going to go. We need to feel confident that consultation is not just um, ticking off the box of consultation. We need to be confident that uh, the ministry will be listening to the experiences of people who actually live here and understand what the challenges are and understand where the model that might work in Toronto might not work at all in our region. Vaujois is calling on the government to release the data collected in regions where the program has already been implemented so that it could help inform the current process. Consultation is expected to continue until the end of the year and anyone waiting to have their say is encouraged to contact the Workforce Planning Board or their local MPP. Large-scale power transmission projects in the province will now bring an opportunity for 50-50 First Nations equity. Hydro One announced Thursday that a model first used in northwestern Ontario will be now applied to all transmission projects valued at over $100 million. Hydro One will partner 50-50 with First Nations on equity for all new large-scale transmission line projects. Once complete, the Wasingan transmission line will run from Thunder Bay to Dryden through Atacokan. It was the first Hydro One project to offer nearby First Nations the option to invest up to 50%. That equity, uh, that equity model is now being applied to five new transmission projects in southern Ontario. Hydro One has not always gotten it right. But today, I'm proud to stand here with you all as we mark the beginning of a new path, one forged in equal partnership with the original stewards of the land. We know that actions speak so much louder than words, and today we are taking one of the boldest economic reconciliation ac actions in Canada. All the previous chiefs and previous councils that worked ever since the treaty was signed, they have, they have undauntedly said we need to be partners and, and to uphold the treaty as a 50-50 partner. And I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Hydro One is making this step, this giant step, and also to make a, an example to other proponents that this has to happen. Wabagoon Lake is one of the eight First Nations that signed the Wasingan Agreement last spring. While well, starting tomorrow night, a new three-part docu-series called Great Lakes Untamed will debut on TV Ontario, and a local cinematographer played a big part in it as around one-third of the series focuses on Lake Superior. Avery McRae has that story. This is the story of the largest watershed on the planet. Never before has there been a production about the Great Lakes quite like this. The three-part series, with each episode an hour in length, will share stories and tales from the five Great Lakes with around 30% of the series to be focused on the grandest of the five bodies of water, Lake Superior. Local director Damian Gilbert, who provided much of the footage from the North Shores of Superior for the dock, has spent over 15 years in the industry and says this one hits close to home and he feels anyone in the city will be able to relate to what they are viewing. It's the greatest lake in the world and uh, they might, you know, recognize some of the locations that are featured in this uh, docuseries. Gilbert said while shooting the series, which is three years in the making, he was able to experience many amazing sites the average person doesn't have access to, like being in the base of Wimet Canyon and a unique view of one of the most famous attractions in our region. So one uh, particular location was uh, Kakabeka Falls and I got a really unique perspective of it, flying with the drone, which we got permission to do, was to kind of start and then kind of go down into the gorge. So when you're seeing it from the platforms, you're not getting it from that perspective, and you might not even recognize it at first. There was also some interesting discoveries made during shooting, none more so than these rocks that originate from Marathon, known as Uperlite, which glow a fiery orange when shined with a UV light. Given GPS coordinates and try to find these things in the pitch dark and then shining lights and not finding anything and all of a sudden this rock kind of started glowing and it's like wow what is this the docuseries will air monday night on tvo at 9 p.m with episodes two and three to follow on tuesday and wednesday nights once all three live airings come to a close all three episodes will be available to stream on tvo 
and YouTube. Avery McRae, TVT News. Well, Goods & Co. was full of music and dancing this afternoon for Culture Days, an annual nationwide event that takes place September 23rd to October 16th to celebrate local arts and culture with a variety of activities and performances. The members of World Dance Collective captivated shoppers with their dance routines as they showcased different dances from around the world, including flamenco, Bollywood, Latin, and dances from the Middle East. The group also had an interactive dance along where audience members were able to join in on the fun and learn a few moves along the way. World Dance Collective President Cassandra Rhodes says it's important to be able to showcase international dances to the public especially up in northwestern Ontario we don't have a lot of cultural uh, dance groups so to showcase any of them is really great and I mean we're just a small uh, number of, of cultural dance so there's a lot in this city and it's just nice to get the opportunity to showcase that for people so they have a little bit of exposure and get to enjoy it. Other activities and performances will be happening across the city over the next month if you would like to participate a full list can be found on the city website. We're now joined by sports anchor Kurt Black. Now the Blue Jays, a really important game for them today, and they really took advantage. Yeah, well, if anyone was watching during the week, I was a little panicked <laughs> yes, throughout when yeah. they lost those two games. They rebounded Saturday night, and they were looking to split the series this afternoon. We'll have those highlights right after the break.